Okay, good afternoon, fun guys and fun girls. Oh, Jesus. That might be the worst one yet. My name's Danny. This is my own worst enemy, mental health podcast. Um, Right, okay, just a quick update, right? So regular listeners will know that I've been <laughs> sort of moaning about car issues for like the past month and a half, right? So just in case you don't know, right, seven weeks ago, my car broke down, yeah? I had to buy a new one. <laughs> Just regular listeners are going to be like, oh, Jesus, not this again. Yes, this again, right? So my car broke down. I had to buy a new one. Right? I got stiffed by by the used car salesman. Spent 1,500 quid on a new car. And it broke down the next day. So I spent the past month and a half shopping for a new car and keep running into all these scruffy, dodgy used car salesmen trying to have my eyes out, selling me all these dirty rust buckets, right? So anyway, right? Finally got a bit of revenge, Okay, so other day found a car, nice car, it's a, a, a Jaguar S-Type, or Jaguar, as our American friends say. Uh, so, yeah, S-Type, uh, leather seats, mint condition, all the electrics and that, just, it, it's gorgeous, okay? Um, and the guy, he's like, he was working off this, like, tiny little lot, um, I think he's just got started. I don't think he was having much luck selling it, and he just sort of wanted a quick sale so he could um, sort of bring in some new cars or whatever. But he wanted cash or a bank transfer. That's what he was saying, either cash or bank transfer. And I'm like, sorry, right? I'm I'm, I'm only only going to buy a credit card because if I buy my credit card, if he sells me another shitter, I'm protected. And uh, but he was like, he's reluctant to do it. He's sort of owning an iron into like, oh, you know, can't you get a loan? Can't you borrow some cash from your family? I'm stonewalling him. I'm not having none of it. I'm saying nope, credit card or nothing. So he gives in, right? Only only problem is. He hasn't got credit card facilities. He has to sort of borrow um, his mate's credit card app on, on, on his iPad, some guy who owned like another car dealership down the road or something. Um, anyway, so what he did, he makes the mistake of signing all the papers and the receipts before taking the payment. And then he hands me the keys in the logbook, right? So it's a done deal. He just needs me to, to pay him. When we come to pay, he says um, he'll have to charge me, you know, like a 3% credit card fee. And I'm like, uh, sorry, Mush, credit card fees were banned back in January this year, right? I wasn't having his eyes out, that's true, yeah? I had a few of them try try that with me recently while I've been car shopping, saying there's like a credit card fee. So in case anyone doesn't know, in the UK at least anyway, can't charge credit card fees anymore. It's gone, yeah? Still places to, having people's eyes out, pretending like they don't know. Anyway, so that pissed on his chips. Um, and anyway, so he, yeah, he processes the payment, He's already lost his 3% credit card fee that he was hoping for. And, um, yeah, tap me number in, credit card payment goes through. Then, of course, the, the, the credit card app that he's using, it charges a like a, a transaction fee. <laughs> and it pops up on the screen, 140 quid, right? His jaw nearly at the floor. I could tell, like, he turns to me genuinely flabbergasted. Like, he wasn't acting, right? And he goes, he's like, I, I can't believe this. I've lost money on this car now. I was only going to make a couple of hundred quid. It's ended up costing me money. And it's like, because he was, yeah, he wanted his quick sale. He was, he, what he was doing is he, he was relying on his um, charging me 3% and he was hoping that this credit card app would be free, I'm guessing. Uh, and I'm just like, well, now we can do about it now, mate. So took the keys, drove off, not bothered. Yeah, sick of yours. You and your used car salesman buddies always, you know, what to play this game, having people's eyes out, conning people out of the money. Yeah, well, calm a baby. So, yeah, anyway, got a nice car now, parts outside, Jag, it looks it's in mint condition, drove it around and got it tested and everything's fine, yeah? So, one nil to me, well, it's not one nil to me, is it? What is it? It's, I'm, two, I'm two one down, is what I am, but better than being two nil down, I suppose. Um. Anyway, oh, what else? Oh, March, Ask Me Anything, AMA episode, now available to subscribers of the podcast. Um, so yeah, unlike these, these regular episodes, the one you're listening to now, um, the subscriber only content, that's not going to show up in your podcast feed, like in, on, on Apple podcasts or Stitcher or whatever you're using, you have to actually like log into the website to view it. So, um, those of you who have subscribed or uh, people have, that have donated, um, 20 pound or more, uh, you should be receiving your login details at some point today in the next few hours, hopefully from, from this episode going live. Um, and they're going to be sent to the same email address that you used during checkout. 
So, you know, I know some people sort of have like separate email addresses for like doing online shopping and stuff like that. So uh, check your emails and check your uh, spam folders as well. Um, and if you're not already a subscriber, you'd like to gain access to the exclusive content, just go to myownworstenemy.org forward slash support um, and subscribe there for as little as £2 a month. Or if you make a, a one-off donation of £20 or more, you gain access for 12 months. Okay, so today's episode. So I like to make fun of people who try and peddle these miracle cures for mental health issues. Like there's, you know, there's, there's loads of websites and sort of self-help gurus out there offering all these sort of magic bullet solutions. And yeah, it's like, at best, it's just something like a, a blog post titled, like how I finally cured my depression. Uh, and at worst, it's like someone selling an ebook with a tagline like the the, the, the the secret solution to depression that experts don't want you to know about. And then it's like, you know, the information contained in this book is worth thousands, but you can have it today for a special discount of just $49. Uh, but hurry, you know, this offer won't last forever. All that crap. Um, it's always the same story as well. Uh, it's always like, you know, the, the the person behind, it's like, oh, I was struggling with depression. It was debilitating. Uh, I went to the doctor. I, I took medication. It, you know, none of it worked. I saw a therapist. I tried CBT. I read all the books, herbal remedies. Uh, I tried exercise, yoga, meditation, but nothing worked. Uh, and yeah, then I, oh, I got so sick of it that I decided to start doing my own research. And uh, usually it's something along the lines of like, um, my search led me away from traditional Western medicine towards the East. Or uh, sometimes they're just arrogant enough to claim that they've developed like the, the, a whole school of thought of their own, all these these techniques from scratch. And uh, and and what I discovered blew my mind. It was so simple. And I, I started to implement these five simple daily exercises. And within days, I was starting to feel better. A month later, I was completely depression free. And now, six months later, I'm feeling better than I ever have before. And you can too, if you whip your credit card out. Um, I hate this shit, right? Because I know people fall for it. Because they're desperate. I've been there, like ready to hand over my credit card details. Just on the, the desperate off chance that this person really has discovered a, a secret that nobody else knows about but luckily for me <laughs> I was sort of I was too broke at the time to bring myself to sort of give in to temptation and also too good at pirating things uh, so that's what I did unashamedly okay all these fancy expensive courses like video courses and ebooks at Pirate Bay and, and, and Tor that's where I got them from and let me tell you something okay more often than not all these snake oil salesmen and women, all they're doing is taking well-founded concepts and, and, and exercises from the likes of like CBT and acceptance and commitment therapy, giving them a new name, yeah, a different name, putting a, a, a different sort of conceptual spin on it and then pretending like they came up with it. So like instead of, um, like, instead of uh, like exposure therapy, they'll call it bravery training or instead of um, like progressive muscle relaxation, they'll call it <laughs> like dissolving trauma. And it's ridiculous, okay? Pro tip, yeah, there is nothing, nothing, nothing you're going to find in any of these secret courses that isn't already written in some form or other in books like um, Mind Over Mood by uh, Greenberger and Podesky or um, Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life by Stephen Hayes. The first book is like full of CBT exercises. The second one is um, acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, you're not going to find anything in, in, in any of these fancy, expensive courses that isn't in those two books. I promise you. I've, I've, I've been through them all, okay? And you can get both those books for like a tenner on Amazon. So, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, the, the, like the concept of, of a miracle cure for depression has always been sort of justifiably ridiculable. Is that a word? justifiably ridiculable it'll do uh, until now maybe let's not get carried away maybe and um of all the things right that it could have been right of all the posh sounding approaches that have, that have been developed for uh, depression anxiety you know like freudian psychoanalysis cognitive behavioral therapy uh, solution focused brief therapy neuro-linguistic programming humanistic Integrative psychotherapy, psychosynthesis, 
transactional analysis, yeah? Turns out, good old-fashioned tripping your bollocks off might be the best solution after all, okay? So, my guest today is Professor Roland Griffiths. Roland is Professor in the Departments of Psychiatry and Neurosciences at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. He is the author of over 360 journal articles and book chapters. He has been a consultant to the National Institutes of Health and to numerous pharmaceutical companies in the development of new psychotropic drugs. He is also currently a member of the Expert Advisory Panel on Drug Dependence for the World Health Organization. In 1999, he initiated a pioneering research program at John Hopkins investigating the psychological and therapeutic effects of the hallucinogen psilocybin, which is a naturally occurring psychedelic compound found in psilocybin mushrooms, known colloquially as magic mushrooms. I'm sure a few of you will be familiar with those. Um... Since then, his studies have included investigations into psilocybin-occasioned mystical-type experiences in healthy volunteers, psilocybin-facilitated treatment of cigarette smoking cessation, very alliterative, and treatment of psychological distress in cancer patients with life-threatening prognoses. In today's episode, we explore the origin and history of psilocybin research, what it looks like to experiment with psychedelics in a clinical setting, the nature of the hallucinations experienced by participants, and the potential for psilocybin to produce long-term, clinically significant reductions in depression and anxiety, along with increases in quality of life, life meaning, and optimism with just one single dose. As always, you can find the show notes at myownworstenemy.org forward slash podcast. And without further ado, what I want you to do now is sit back, relax, close your eyes, turn your attention inwards, and please enjoy my conversation with Professor Roland Griffiths. Right, okay, Roland Griffiths. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you, Danny. Pleased to be, join you. Uh, I think after this, Roland, uh, after you've studied what you're studying at the moment, the next thing you might want to study is something like the efficacy of persistence in wearing down academics to appear on podcasts. Because I think <laughs> I've, I've mithered you more than I've mithered any other guest to, to, to appear on this podcast. But it, it, we, it worked. We got there in the end. It works. And thank you for being <laughs> persistent. I've enjoyed, I've listened to a number of your podcasts. I've enjoyed them. I just get very busy <laughs> and caught up with other things. Right. Well, we're here now. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. Um, I know it's going to be something a bit, a little left field as well for, for, for my audience. So, um, so today we're talking about the I'm going to put this, the potential psychological benefits of ingesting psilocybin, which is a hallucinogenic compound found in um, what, well, people will know it as magic mushrooms, I guess. Um, so, okay, so I've, I, I first heard of you through um, Tim Ferriss on the Tim Ferriss podcast. Um, and so I think through him, I mean, his, his podcast, one of the biggest ones in the world and um, so I think a lot of people will know who you are already and, and about the research you're doing. But just for the people who don't know, if you could just tell us a little bit about you, who you are, what you do, and um, give us a sort of like a, a nice, broad overview of like what, we're, what exactly it is we're dealing with here. Then we can sort of uh, like cherry pick different aspects to, to elaborate upon. Okay, well, so I have a PhD in psychopharmacology. I've been um, a professor in the departments of psychiatry and neuroscience at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, where for more than the past 40 years, I've been studying mood altering drugs, primarily uh, drugs of uh, abuse, but psychoactive drugs. About uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I took up a meditation practice. <clears throat> and that got me very interested in the nature of altered states of consciousness um, and the potential for transformative change that can come out of some of those altered states of consciousness. At the time, I was doing work with a variety of mood-altering drugs, like I said, mostly drugs of abuse, 
Um, and I, uh, but, but what happened was I actually became fascinated with the process of meditation and that p- process of self exploration. And I started reading the literature on meditation and comparative religion and trying to understand this field that I really had, um, you know, very little personal uh, affiliation and exposure to uh, previously. And as I got more deeply into that, as in a path of self-discovery, if you will, I, I became reacquainted with this older literature with the classic psychedelic drugs like psilocybin or LSD or DMT or and and the and the claim that these drugs under appropriate conditions could occasion some of these altered states of consciousness that really were of so much interest to me and um, of course this now was mid uh, 1990s when research almost worldwide had been shut down with the with the classic psychedelics uh, for several decades. Um, so uh, your listeners have, I'm sure very well may remember that the psychedelic drugs like LSD and psilocybin and the like uh, became quite popularized in the late 50s and in the 60s um, and actually had been a real focus of interest and uh, research attention back then. And then we had the phenomena of the psychedelic 60s and and Timothy Leary, who initially initiated a, a, a very programmatic uh, uh, approach to studying these compounds, but very quickly departed from that and um, and and really in a sense gave uh, the psychedelic research uh, uh, a, a bad name insofar as he became a proponent for uh, widespread use with his uh, tune in turn in turn on and drop out uh, saying and of course he and uh, and Richard Alpert, who later became Ram Dass, were terminated from Harvard at the time. And then the, these drugs also in the 1960s, uh, you know, became associated with uh, the upheaval in the Haight-Ashbury district in San Francisco and the anti-war movement and really a uprising of a youthful movement against, uh, you know, existing uh, political and authoritarian structure. And as a consequence, we had a lot of cultural blowback where there was a lot of concerns about these, uh, about these drugs. Richard Nixon at one point, uh, is alleged to have said that Timothy Leary was the most dangerous man in America because of his advocacy for use of these, uh, of these compounds. Um, uh, so, uh, as a consequence, uh, we had a cultural pushback uh, of this, and there was a lot of negative media attention that, uh, and some false reporting that led us, you know, really as a culture to conclude that possibly the risks of exposure to these compounds outweighed any possible benefits. And as a consequence, for some period of decades, no clinical research was done with the classic uh, psychedelic drugs. And uh, Rick Straussman, who was interested in DMT, did some studies in the early 1990s, but those were in people who were drug experienced DMT users. So by the time I became interested in this, and this was about 2000, It had been decades um, since there was any approval, at least in the United States, to administer these compounds uh, to healthy volunteers who were drug naive. And so it was by no means clear that we could get approval uh, to do this. But I was deeply curious uh, because of 
my meditation practice and the interest in altered states of consciousness. And, um, and I wrote a protocol that had to go through multiple levels of regulatory uh, um, approval, both in my institution, Johns Hopkins, which is a very uh, rigorous but conservative medical institution, and through the Food and Drug Administration, which is our federal drug regulatory approval authority, and then uh, the DEA, which um, uh, oversees the uh, the legality and licensing of access to these compounds. So it was a long shot, frankly, and uh, I wrote this protocol thinking that mm, maybe there's less than 50% chance I could even get approval, but we did, and we ran this first study, and, um, and I went into that study, I have to say, as somewhat of a skeptic. So there are, there are those who have had prior experiences with these classic hallucinogens um, that have strong and very often positive feelings about what they can, uh, what they can do. I wasn't among uh, that group. I was one who was curious. I was curious about the effects, but I was also very contented with my meditation practice. And I really thought maybe there was a lot of hype around these drugs. So I really wasn't fully prepared for the um, for the remarkable effects that were forthcoming. In our trial, we gave psilocybin to hallucinogen naive individuals under conditions in which they knew that on one of three sessions they would get a dose of psilocybin, but they also were told they could get a variety of other drugs and different doses of psilocybin. And they were hallucinogen naive, so they didn't quite know what to expect. So they didn't come in with a strong knowing or expectation. And we give the uh, psilocybin under conditions in which we develop rapport uh, and trust with these volunteers prior to these sessions. And then they, they, they come in and take the capsule in the morning and then we have them lay down on a couch. It's a comfortable living room like environment. Uh, we have them put eye shades on to direct their attention inward and, and use headphones through which they listen to a program of music so that they're really asked to direct their attention inward on their inner experience. This isn't a guided meditation in any form. And we're not encouraging them to interact with the uh, with the sitters or or monitors who are who are present. And the remarkable feature of this, from my standpoint, having studied many many different classes of psychoactive drugs, was um, uh, that as ex well as expected psilocybin, a high dose of psilocybin under these conditions produced effects similar to those produced by and by the classic hallucinogen. So they're kind of visual distortions, visual imagery comes up, there's cognitive uh, changes, there's, you know, different kinds of uh, thinking, there can be emotions, both pleasant and unpleasant, sometimes transcendent or uh, are peaceful emotions, but uh, as well, anxiety or panic or fear can come up. So all that happened. But the most interesting piece of it to me was that there was a quality to these experiences that really mapped directly onto so-called naturally occurring mystical experiences that had been described by religious figures um, and and others throughout the ages uh, and um, in fact the people in the psychology of religion uh, have you know developed good sets of questionnaires to um, assess these kinds of effects the uh, basic mystical experience was initially 
described by William James back in the early uh, 1900s, and he and he talked about it in terms of a conversion experience. But it has many many names: conversion experience, a transformative moment, uh, uh, a peak experience, an epiphany. Um, so it, it comes by many names. It has been described, you know, widely historically, but it really appears so infrequently and unpredictably that it, it feels really quite anomalous. Um, uh, but yet the experiences people were having mapped clearly onto the structure of those experiences that have been described by these people in the psychology of religion. And, and, the, and I can just give you the quality of those experiences. There's, there are several features of them. The, one of the defining qualities is the sense of unity or the interconnectedness of all people and things. And that's accompanied by a sense of sacredness or present uh, or preciousness or reverence for that experience. And it's felt to have this um, sense of authoritative truth value. It's said to be noetic in a sense. And it's also very often accompanied by feelings of positive emotional valence like love and, and peace and gentleness, transcendence of time and space where past and presence collapse into the present moment, space becomes vast, endless. And the final quality is that the, the experience is felt to be ineffable. That is people, one of the first things people say at the end of these experiences is I can't put it into words. So that was the, that was the core experience that occurred in a high proportion of our volunteers uh, and mapped onto these classic experiences. So I thought, well, gee, that, that's really interesting. Now, Psilocybin, of course, is just it's just a drug. It's going to be eliminated fairly quickly. So by the end of the session, those effects are gone. But what was really amazing about these experiences is that the memories and the thoughts about these experiences uh, endured. They persisted. And uh, so much so that I didn't even I didn't have the foresight to even begin to develop a questionnaire that would assess these kinds of effects. But to give you an example, we actually developed after we started this study a questionnaire that asked people, well, when I first sat down and talked to some of these volunteers and I and the way this first uh, experiment was set up, that the, the uh, uh, sessions occurred at two monthly intervals. So it was two months later, I was sitting down and I said, well, so, yeah, what do you remember of the experience? Uh, and these volunteers would turn to me and say, you know, that was one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. <laughs> and I have to say that just seems so improbable uh, to me. And and it was then later, and I would say, well, what does that mean? Thinking maybe they had very limited life experience. And they would say, well, you know, it's, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to put into words, but, you know, it's, it's meaningful in the way that the birth of my firstborn child is meaningful to me, or perhaps the death of my parent. Um, and, and we have the majority of people reporting experiences like this. So it turns out that um, in that first study, um, it was uh, well over 60 percent of volunteers had among the five most personally meaningful and spiritually significant experiences of their lives. Thirty percent said it was the single most spiritually significant experience of their entire life. And this is rating it two months after the experience. I might add that we, the control condition in this study was a pretty high dose, dose of methylphenidate, which is Ritalin. And um, under these conditions that are really optimized to uh, produce meaningful experiences, there were a couple of people who had 
experiences that that uh, looked like mystical experiences but by and large there's just a huge difference and there's and we've done any number of studies since then that really shows that this is pharmacologically specific it's dose dependent and it's a a very robust and reliable scientific finding and so uh, not only do people report that this experience is personally meaningful and spiritually significant, they report enduring positive changes in moods, attitudes, and behaviors well after the experience. So we've gone out to 14 months, and about 80 to 90 percent of people are continuing to say that experience you know, is among the five most meaningful of my of my life. But 90 percent are saying that it's associated with increased life satisfaction and enduring behavioral positive uh, positive behavioral change. So that's a it just <laughs> from a from a scientific point of view, it's just a it's an absolutely fascinating observation. So we have the majority of people, these are healthy volunteers, reporting these kinds of experiences that have these enduring positive changes in mood, attitude, and behavior. It's really exciting from a scientific point of view because, as I mentioned, these experiences have been noted and described over the ages but they've never been amenable to prospective scientific study because they just, they, they appeared capricious, you know, very often associated with a prayer practice, maybe meditation practice, maybe just, uh, you know, a walk on the beach or some unusual, you know, circumstance that they came out. But that, that means that you really can't run a study on it. Um, but if we we now have conditions which I think of as optimized for producing these experiences and those conditions involve the administration of a high dose of psilocybin, but I don't in any means think that psilocybin is necessary for the human organism to have these uh, experiences. And so it, it, it's a it becomes a fascinating puzzle about um, how it is, why it is we're wired for these experiences, what function do they serve, you know, evolutionarily, biologically, spiritually, uh, you know, what's, what's, <laughs> what's going on here. And then there are a whole array of, you know, therapeutic applications, they're kind of neuroscience questions, there are questions about the uh, basic uh, biology of, uh, of human consciousness uh, that, uh, that can be addressed uh, by working with these compounds. So there's a lot of research to be done. Right, Roland. So we've got, I mean, we've got plenty plenty to work with there i think i've already um i've just been sitting here sort of jotting down the the the, the questions that have sort of naturally arisen out of that introduction there and um we've got <laughs> we've got plenty to unpack here <laughs> um so yeah well our interest is is, is sort of primary i'm primarily interested in in its in its application to um things like treatment resistant depression and um a little bit of the the like the work you've done on um addiction as well i think that's quite interesting um but in particular i think the most like profound study you did was with um with cancer patients who had had um a, a, a fatal um or possibly fatal diagnosis um and that i mean that's the results of that one really do fascinate me but we'll we'll get to that so let me just pick some of these things apart and i want to go straight straight back to the beginning and i've I've got to ask you it's a very um so your interest in i'm interested in your interest in in in, in psychopharmacology in the first place um so how how did you come to this this before the psilocybin, why psychopharmacology? What what's the interest there? Well, 
You know, that was, you know, one of those, uh, cap- I think, uh, uh, capricious uh, meanderings of, and happenstance of, uh, or circumstance of, uh, you know, my younger academic career. I, I was interested in, uh, in physiological psych- uh, psychology. I was interested in medicine. Um, I uh, ended up in... Uh, college doing a summer program that put me into uh, uh, working in a mental hospital. And in the course of that, I volunteered and did some work in their psychopharmacology research laboratory and so got my first taste of animal research in psychopharmacology. And in the course of starting to apply to graduate schools at the same time I was applying to the Peace Corps out of out of college. Uh, I was looking at a variety of uh, psychology programs and one of them happened to have a, a fellowship in psychopharmacology and I had done this little work in psychopharmacology previously so I applied for that and got a fellowship and <laughs> and then got trained in psychopharmacology. I, mean, I just I was I'm interested in uh, science and orderly, uh, an orderly behavioral and psychological process, and um, and so that training that I got at University of Minnesota in pharmacology and it was the experimental analysis of behavior, which is a very systematic way of looking at behavior, uh, it set me on a course for um, uh, studying uh, drugs and drug abuse pharmacology. And the National Institute on Drug Abuse has really been my uh, home uh, research institute throughout my career. I've had grants uh, continuously from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And so I've been very interested in the development of methods to, to um measure and assess abuse liability of drugs. I uh, spent a a couple of decades splitting my time between animal research of models of addiction as well as human uh, research and models of addiction. I uh, I ventured into many, many different psychoactive uh, classes of compounds, but have done substantial work uh, with sedative hypnotics and uh, and with caffeine, which is actually a very interesting model system to look at in in humans. Um, uh, so uh, that was the background I had in going into this. I uh, established myself as an expert in developing methods to test novel compounds for abuse liability. So. I was well acquainted with clinical trial methodology. Um, and so when it came time to ask a question about the, uh, uh, the, the subjective effects and consequential effects of something like a psychedelic, I think I was as well prepared as I could be, uh, only these drugs hadn't been studied in decades. Yeah, but I mean, you see, that's the, the other thing you mentioned as well. Sort of this, the, the kind of this hard science side of uh, of looking at the, you know, the, the the chemical side of the the human experience, I guess. Um, but then you, you mentioned this 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 um, sort of foray into meditation and a and a journey of self discovery, which is sort of the um, a sort of the 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 seeds of the the complementary side to this this idea uh, to, to the concept of psilocybin. And so I'm wondering, do you mind sharing what that was? Why why did you get into meditation? What was the, the like this this self discovery, uh, this journey of self discovery? What what prompted that? Mm. Well, yeah, that's an interesting question. So I guess, I guess you know I was always been curious about the nature of consciousness and the nature of mind, and uh, even back in graduate school. Uh, in Minneapolis, there was a, a, a meditation teacher in town, and I uh, and I became interested in learning about meditation and went to 
several classes and and immediately I recognized that the language system that was being used to describe what was going on in meditation didn't fit at all with what we knew about physiology and neuropharmacology. I mean, they talk about chakras and these subtle energy channels and moving energy through the chakra system. And, and, um, and I couldn't map that onto any of my physiology classes, but, but I think I was also, and, and I, and I also was being concurrently trained very rigorously in the experimental analysis of behavior, which, uh, is really the, uh, Skinnerian approach, uh, to, uh, uh, to empirically looking at determinants of uh, behavior. It's a very hard nosed way of uh, analyzing behavioral output. And so, so what I recognized in the meditation teachings was that, uh, the language that they were using, uh, it, it was, you know, I, I couldn't validate that scientifically. And frankly, mm. I doubted it to be true, but it also struck me that these are methodologies of introspection that have been developed over thousands of years. And that, and that it could be that on a metaphorical level, they have very powerful ways of, of describing experiences. So I, w I was willing to suspend mm, scientific understanding to just um, explore what it is from use from the use of metaphors and and the techniques they were teaching what it is I could learn about this inner realm of consciousness and introspection well <laughs> so so I was open to it but but frankly I ran headlong into the experience that many many beginning meditators have and that is that the mind just mutinies yep. it it becomes uh, an <laughs> immediate hell realm where you're just sitting there with your thoughts thinking that somehow you're supposed to quiet your thoughts and it and and three hours or three minutes felt like three hours to me yeah and so i i i became very impatient very quickly and although i was sympathetic to it i i dropped it right and it wasn't you know until you know some 20 years later that I had a good friend who got interested in um, in meditation, and they started going to one of these meditation centers here, and and so I I went I went back and tried again, and I can't tell you what was different. I can't tell you whether I'm different or the teachings were different or I was more open, but there was something that opened in that experience. I engaged with it in a way that I go, oh, uh, you know, this is interesting. Yeah, there is there is something really interesting here. And I kind of suspected that to be true, but I I, I hadn't encountered it before. Have you and had any kind of um, what you'd consider it like a spiritual experience through meditation? Yes. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, I'd be surprised if, Many people who spent much time in meditation uh, didn't. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's initially very difficult to. Do you have a meditation practice, Dan? Um, I, I did. I, well, I do, but it's it's kind of uh, it's very random at the moment. So there was um, there was a period of about eighteen months there where I did it religiously. I did it every day, and I was experimenting with um, uh, like going in flotation tanks as well with sensory deprivation. Um, uh, and I, I, I kind of I wouldn't say I've, I had a spiritual experience through meditation. I did manage um, kind of a. a a peaceful level of consciousness that I've never accessed before. I wouldn't mm -hmm. say that was spiritual, but my mm -hmm. experience in the flotation tank, that mm -hmm. was, um, that was, yeah. I'm reluctant to use words like spiritual. I'm just kind of, yes. yeah, very sort of ma very materialist in that sense. But um, yes, that's the best word I can think to describe it is a spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. 
So, so there are many, many flavors, of course, of meditation experiences. And um, the form of meditation that I initially got involved with um, prioritized um, emergent experiences out of meditation. Uh, and so there was a lot of attention paid to that. And that comes out of a Hindu tradition. But um, I would say my practice now is uh, is more inclined toward uh, Buddhism and Vipassana, mm. which actually, you know, prioritizes um, uh, not so much uh, kind of the immediate experience, but uh, the insights that come from um, uh, from being able to watch and uh, and see the nature of mind, uh, but but even even in the Vipassana tradition or the Zen tradition, if one sits long enough, there are going to be emergent experiences. I think inevitable that come out of those and. And then whether or not the term spiritual is the right one or not. I mean, spiritual is a terrible word because it means so much, many different things to different uh, people. But there really can be this sense of, you know, deep abiding, knowing and calmness uh, and watching uh, that emerges out of these experiences that really are, can be fairly can be very profound. And they can and they can change people remarkably, but I think I would challenge anyone to who goes. I mean, if, if you do a, a seven or ten day silent meditation retreat, you're <laughs> you're gonna, you're going to come upon obstacles of minds, mind and experiences, uh, uh, you know, that are really quite striking mm. and uh, and may and may. Uh, and may um, uh, d- deserve uh, further further attention. Uh, okay, so let's let's sort of let's dig into the um, let's dig into the psilocybin specifically now, and just uh, just quickly, Roland, if if you could just um, just we've mentioned this word psilocybin a few times and I've sort of thrown out the word magic mushroom and but some people might not know what, what either of those mean. So if you could just just briefly just say what psilocybin is, but also I'm interested in why psilocybin as the, as the chemical compound chosen to be studied as opposed to LSD or mescaline, DMT, why psilocybin? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... Psilocybin is one of um, uh, several well-known classic hallucinogens or classic psychedelic drugs. Uh, they're 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 similar in so far as we know that their their molecular mechanisms of action are similar. These are compounds, and and the ma- the major ones are psilocybin from the so-called magic mushroom. Uh, um, DMT, which is the primary ingredient in ayahuasca, uh, mescaline, which is the primary ingredient in peyote cactus, and all three of those have been used, you know, by uh, you know by various cultures in structured manners for divinatory or religious purposes for hundreds if not thousands of years and the other classic psychedelic is lsd which was is um, uh, a man-made uh psychedelic all of these drugs they have some differences in pharmacology but they all share this common primary molecular site of action and that's serotonin 2a receptor and they're and they function there as uh, partial agonists. Now, the serotonin system, serotonin is a neurotransmitter in the brain. It's one of the oldest, most ancient signaling system in uh, evolutionary terms uh, uh, in, in the brain. And this is interacting with a subset of serotonin 
receptors. Uh, so we know it has that in, in common. We know, um, we know a, a little bit more about how, uh, how these, uh, drugs work. We know that they, uh, from neuro, we know where serotonin 2A receptors are located in brain. And, and it has to be those receptor sites that initiate action. We know from neuroimaging studies in humans what areas of brain are activated and what areas of brain are deactivated if you give psilocybin. And we know something about the network um, activity that occurs after you take a drug like psilocybin or LSD. That is, the you know the hubs of the brain that are connected or uh, and you know for some period of time after after taking it. And, and we have some ideas, some ideas about some interesting network uh, effects of these drugs that might account for some of the most interesting uh, effects. And we can we could talk about those if you like. But but I think one of the points that I really want to make is actually how little we understand about the nature of these drugs and how they affect human consciousness. Uh, so our understanding of human consciousness is really incredibly primitive. Um, you know, there's a very credible question called the hard problem of consciousness, which is, you know, how is it that we are conscious? Is consciousness reducible to uh, neural molecular mechanisms? And there are those people who say, well, certainly it has to be. What else could it be? Uh, and then there are those who would argue that um, uh, explanatorily uh, uh, there's a conundrum there. And the very nature, the subjective nature of consciousness uh, suggests that it may not be reducible uh, in, the, in the same sense that other mechanisms are. Um, it's, it's, it's an open, kind of interesting, fascinating, both scientific and, uh, and philosophical problem. As a neuroscientist, you know, to... Uh, to engage with this, I, I have to take, I have to take as a given the reductionistic mechanism as a starting place, uh, because I don't know how to <laughs> engage with, uh, with the other. Mm -hmm. But, you know, whether, whether that's ends up being true or not is, uh, a little un, is unknown. I think, I mean, for me, what's so, profoundly exciting about the study of the psychedelics is that they they really are a, a unique window into the very nature of consciousness itself uh, the very you know the the whole contemplation that we are these evolved organisms that have become aware that we're aware we have this self-reflective capacity to recognize <laughs> that the lights are on, that we're awake. Uh, and in fact, you know, it's only our own felt experience that we can validate. I mean, that's, that's all we know, actually, is that we're conscious. And we can't know that of anyone else. You know, we can infer it, you know, but there's something... <laughs> There's something so profoundly interesting uh, about the nature of these experiences as it shines a light on to that very mysterious question about what it is that we're doing here. Why, <laughs> why are we here? I mean, it's, it's the existential core of the human dilemma. Why are we here? Uh, what happens when we die? <laughs> what's what's going on here anyway yeah is it the is it the nature of the the experience of psilocybin that makes it um more clinically significant than maybe dmt or lsd or is it safer is that what's the what's the what's the reason for yeah. for 
I mean, did you choose to study psilocybin or was it, you know, when you first conceived of this idea, was it just hallucinogens in, in general? How, but yeah, it's, why, why, why psilocybin? That's what yeah, I'm, why, I'm... Why psilocybin? Yeah. Good. Okay. So um, let's see there. Uh, psilocybin had just had a number of features about it that recommended it as... Uh, as uh, to us as among the most um, uh, scientifically manipulable psychedelics available. So uh, psilocybin has a duration of action of four to six hours, which is um, substantially longer than DMT, which if DMT is given uh, intravenously or insulated, it just it lasts just minutes. If it's given in the, in the, you know, in the form of ayahuasca, it's uh, that you're just degrading its uh, metabolism, and that's um, pharmacologically that's not a very good, good uh, experimental approach to things, because you're looking really at a drug interaction and a metabolic interaction. Um, so it has a, uh, it has a. a uh, duration of action four to six hours, whereas mescaline and LSD has have durations more on the order of twelve hours. Wow! And just from the clinical management point of view, if you're going to bring someone into the into the laboratory, you know, four to six hours is tractable. Fifteen minutes is is uh, is probably too short, and that's the clinical hunch of that. It's just it, you're up and down so quickly uh, that it's more difficult, we think, uh, to extract the kind of information that comes out of a psilocybin experience. Although I, you know, we're, would be very eager to work more closely with uh, uh, DMT, and then LSD and mescaline. Just the duration of action is just exhausting, and the exhausting. Uh, you know, for the volunteer and for our clinical guides and for our medical coverage. And then the other, uh, well, the, one other thing is that psilocybin really had a reputation of being um, uh, easier to work with than LSD. There, there seems to be a higher rate of adverse events with LSD, but I'm not, I'm not, certain that that would be true if given under you know clinically managed conditions but it had that reputation but i think <laughs> most of all the thing that recommended it over lsd was no one knew how to spell it and and so it didn't have the cultural baggage right. that lsd had uh and that and that was and that, in fact, was critically important when we initiated these studies because we knew we were um, we were going against a strong cultural bias that had already demonized these uh, these substances, and and we didn't need any of that extra baggage uh, to be dragged in. Yeah, you did. You did mention before about um, the like you you thought it was like a flip of a coin whether you were actually gonna um this was going to be accepted by the was it the ethics committee um yeah. i know it's probably pure speculation but why why do you think it got accepted well i think a num number of reasons i think one is we had a very credible application uh you know we're coming out of a major medical institution and and the investigative team was well uh, credentialed. We were cautious in what we were um, what we were uh, proposing, uh, and I think enough time had gone by since the uh, the anxiety of the 1960s that that the reviewers at the FDA were willing to take a fresh look at that. And that would have been true also of our review board at, at Johns Hopkins. I'm actually very proud of Johns Hopkins as an institution because it would have been, it would have been, um, 
easy for an institution to take a look at a proposal such as we gave, you know, put forth and said, you know what, the potential public relations risk doesn't outweigh the potential benefits. We should just kill this. And, you know, and Hopkins um, prioritizes uh, science and uh, rational decision making. And the, uh, the Institutional Review Board passed our protocol up through administrative channels, lawyers, deans, <laughs> everyone getting second opinions. It got sent out for external reviewers. So it, it, it got scrutinized really tightly, mm. but it did not get pushed back for political reasons. And I'm, and, and that turned out to be exactly the right decision. We now have, treated over 300 people, had over 600 sessions. Uh, we've developed a fairly large safety database and now other institutions, you know, both in the United States and in Europe and UK uh, have come online. They're doing research with psilocybin. There are some clinical trials now underway uh, and being explored uh, for uh, registration trials for uh, treatment of um, of uh, mood disorders with psilocybin, so there's there's no no question that the our IRB and our ethical committees made the right decision, but it was but it wasn't clear at the time that they would do so. So I'm uh, I'm very gratified that they they did. What was the um... How did you make the connection to apply the potential of, of, of psilocybin ingestion to depression? Because, you know, it, I, there's a, a million things that could have you, you could try it on, especially from a, um, you know, a psychological perspective and, and see what it works against. And I'm just wondering how, how that connection was made. Was it, and was it anything to do with, because you, you mentioned uh, Timothy Leary did, um, some studies back in the 60s. I'm just wondering if, you know, what he was doing was was sort of a clue to that. Yeah, well, you you mentioned our first study and, and one that we showed very profound effects with was of psilocybin in cancer patients with a life-threatening cancer diagnosis yes. who yeah. had very significant anxiety or depression secondary to their diagnosis. And so we ran a, a clinical trial and published that in 2016. And NYU ran a, a, a parallel uh, study showing very similar results. And what we were able to show there is that a single dose, high dose of psilocybin given uh, to these individuals had really quite uh, profound uh, effects of the of the type that I'd already described for the healthy volunteers, um, but with a concomitant uh, substantial decrease in in symptoms of anxiety and depression, uh, and so um, we what we showed was um, uh, at six months uh, eighty percent of our volunteers showed something called a clinical response. And that means that their, um, their depression scores as rated by a gold standard measure, cl a clinician rated measure, had dropped at least 50% of baseline. And actually 60% were showing symptom remission. That is their symptom score was down in the range that would be considered normal, not not at all uh, depressed. So that that's remarkable. So what we have there is a single dose, and many of the people had these, you know, experiences of the type I described before, mystical type experiences. But some sometimes it plays out differently. Sometimes they're experiences of um, personal insight or psychological insight. Uh, uh, but the remarkable piece is that a single treatment resulted in these sustained effects on these 
symptoms that are, you know, notoriously difficult uh, to treat. And, it, and it's really, we don't have a model within psychiatry of uh, single interventions, single discrete mm. interventions that produce enduring effects of that sort. You, you might think, well, maybe shock treatment, but, you know, shock treatment is actually electric convulsive shock treatment is a series of uh, treatments and uh, and you don't get the extent of remission and the uh, and the enduring nature of it very often of the type we've got. So there's something very powerful. So I think um, that these um, uh, existentially induced, mood crises such as face the existential crisis of facing death uh, is is really one um, target one therapeutic target that's quite amenable to psychedelic treatment we are now running a trial in uh, major depression and uh, and we did that partly building off of uh, the work that we did in cancer patients, but also building off of observations that were made uh, by the uh, Imperial Group with Robin Carhart Harris and David Nutt in London, in which they ran a pilot study in 15 volunteers, I believe, uh, in which they treated people with treatment-resistant depression, and they uh, they got two doses of of psilocybin and they and they produced effects that weren't they weren't sustained as long as the effects that we had but they did show a treatment effect so we we now have started a study in uh in depression and uh it's too early to say uh definitively how that is going to look i think there's probably it's likely that there's going to be more variability and those results and we we showed with the uh, the cancer results and that may not shouldn't come as a surprise because depression is you know is a heterogeneous disorder so there are different factors that will create and uh, susceptibility to depression and so I suspect that psilocybin will be uh, very useful for treating some forms of depression and less so for other forms but we we simply don't know enough about it yet yeah one of, one of the interesting questions that this sort of uh, sort of threw up for me is um so i mean uh, psychiatry is, is uh, particularly at the moment being sort of he very heavily criticized um you know particularly in the like the field of um antidepressants at the moment that's a you know it's a big thing at the moment and um with this being, like you say, it's um, it, it's like a single dose cure. It's 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 almost it's magic bullet territory. You know, one one dose of this stuff at six month follow up changes. This, this, it says here, this is from the abstract. At six months follow up, these changes were sustained with about eighty percent of participants continuing to show clinically significant decreases in depressed mood and anxiety. And for for, for all the, this criticism that psychiatry is getting, you know, it's not it's not a brain it's not a brain chemical problem. It's it's a lifestyle problem. To an extent, this seems to maybe validate um, or go again validate psychiatry, go against some of the cri criticisms of psychiatry. But then at the end of of the abstract, a really interesting um, sentence is that. Mystical type psilocybin experience on session day mediated the effect of psilocybin dosed on therapeutic outcomes. So in, in English, basically, that means that the psilocy taking psilocybin isn't isn't necessarily what had any effect. It was the it was the mystical experience of the psilocybin that created those results. Is that correct? Um let's see. It's it's kind of correct. <laughs> okay, but let's see what that's saying. So we've we've observed that repeatedly across a number of different studies, and that is that um, that people who have experiences that can be described as mystical type experiences 
are going to be much more likely to report positive enduring effects later on. Now, that could be just increased spiritual significance in our smoking studies. It would be uh, smoke, you know, reduced craving. In the cancer studies, it's reduced uh, depression and anxiety. Uh, so there's there's something that's getting measured uh, immediately after the session. This mystical experience questionnaire is completed right at the post session that predicts what the outcome is going to be, you know, six months down the road. And that in in that in that sense, uh, it's a it's a mediator, uh, right? Um, because in absence of those kinds of experiences people are are less likely to produce those those effects uh i guess the, the the question that sort of arises from it is is what's what's happening is it you know is is psilocybin is it sort of and, and you know another thing that's spoken about a lot at the moment is this this concept of neuroplasticity is is psilocybin literally sort of rewiring the brain is it that the the spiritual experience that's ex, that, that that happens during the session is changing people's um, sort of life philosophy, their world view? What what do you think is is at the I don't know at the most sort of materialist level it is what's happening? Mm. Um, well, that, <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the, that's the interesting question. What's What's happening here and how is it happening? And that's, you know, of, of, of huge interest to, to us as, as it should be. Um, and, and it, and the answer has to be, it's, uh, or is very likely going to be, it's, it's all of these things playing together. So certainly there are, there are effects of psilocybin on brain acutely. And the very fact that people have, have enduring memories of these experiences means that something has been changed uh, in brain. So, so you know, so there's something going on there. Now, one of the kind of interesting hypotheses, you know, has to do with network function. And, and so one of the interesting stories that's told about psilocybin based on this early neuroimaging work is that the Carhartt Harris Imperial Group has shown that psilocybin and LSD administered acutely decreases activity in something called the default mode network. And this is a brain network that's uh, active when uh, when you ask people just to be quiet and, and sit at rest. Don't do anything. <laughs> and when you say don't do anything, there's activity that occurs in this in this network. There's no such thing as not doing anything. And uh, that activity, uh, and that's why it's called default mode network. That's if, if you're if you're not paying attention to anything, that's the network that's active. Um, now, activity in that net network increases in people who are depressed and people that get involved in ruminative activity. It's kind of, it's sometimes thought to be like self-referential processing when you're kind of wrapped up in your own story uh, that increases. And here we have the observation that psilocybin is producing acute decreases in that, opposite to that produced by depression. And here's another interesting observation it turns out that in meditators, long-term meditators, they too have decreases in the default mode network. And so that that's attractive because it um, seems to be a similar appeal to this uh, decreased uh, sense of, of self and self-referential processing mm. uh, and co coming into, if you will, uh, the the present moment. Um, so we're very interested in looking for neural traces uh, that that occur uh, and uh, that occur 
um, and are sustained after psilocybin. And we have some beginning hints of those, but we haven't nailed anything solid down. In terms of neuroplasticity, there's a, there's a wonderful image that the, um, uh, that the Imperial group, uh, published in one of their studies. And it was showing patterns of brain interconnectivity that occurs acutely after administration of psilocybin and they, and similar effects occur after LSD. And, and this is from, uh, functional magnetic imaging, uh, uh, work that's showing, um, different areas of brain that just get, that are connected generally to one another. And they show it under placebo and you see these connections occurring across different networks and within networks. And if you give psilocybin, there's this huge increase in activity and it's occurring both within networks and across networks. It's not random. There's something, there's something very, coordinated about it in so far as you, you can see by the diagram that there's information flowing back and forth in a in a way that's really quite astounding and as far as we know unprecedented and then that dissipates when the within when the psilocybin dissipates but at least and it, and it raises this question of neuroplasticity and it leaves open this kind of interesting speculation that um, under these conditions of this, uh, you know, wildly active, interconnected uh, network activity, whether there might be some therapeutic value in that, that uh, if you thought of uh, disease processes or, uh, or certainly emotional disease processes as being partly due to network functioning that is not working properly, you know, have gotten ingrained into, in, into loops of some, some type, hmm. this, this could almost be a resetting, uh, you know, it's like a resetting of a computer that's, that's hung up. And it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting kind of fun metaphor to play with. We don't know that it's true. Um, uh, but, uh, but who knows? It, it may have some truth. Then, you know, the other mechanism you, you kind of, uh, alluded to there, and, and I just say that they're not independent of neural mechanisms, but these, uh, you know, there can be profound shifts in sense of self and, and worldview that occur out of these experiences. And, um, and those can be just fundamentally reorganizational really profoundly so. Uh, so, you know, with respect to, for instance, the studies that we've done in cigarette smoking, where people, you know, have felt enslaved to smoking cigarettes and unable repeatedly to, you know, have failed many, many times to quit smoking. And they'll have these kinds of uh, sessions and they'll, They'll recognize the enormity of consciousness, uh, the gift of what it is to, um, uh, to be embodied in consciousness. And actually, uh, with that, uh, comes a, um, a sense of self-efficacy, a sense that, uh, uh, that they can reauthor their behavior that they're in charge in in a way that they had ceased to believe that they were and so it so there can be a profound sense of increased self-efficacy and mindfulness and respect for the uh the largeness of mind and consciousness uh that i think can be very helpful in having people make radical changes in their behavior. I know, this is, I know this is going to be like um, a purely subjective um, 
question to ask you, Roland, but I'm just wondering if you think like the, these these huge concepts that people come come away with from the, these these it's like it's a revelatory experience. People uh, um, described it as sort of finding themselves plugged into the universe or um, experiencing universal consciousness, and they, they, you know they realize the the total interconnectedness of the the universe and of all life on Earth, and really like big concepts like that. And I'm just wondering, do you think that 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 those experiences do they represent something? Do you think they represent something fundamentally true about life and about the universe, or is it just um, is it just coming away with a sort of um, a, a sort of heartwarming delusion that might not necessarily be true? I mean, it's nice and everything, but it's just it's just a persistent delusion if that makes sense yeah it it makes sense um let's see i i mean I, you know let me just return to this idea that um if we if we direct our attention inward what you know what do we know about ourselves you know we know that we're we're conscious that we're aware uh and what else do we really know about ourselves not much. Uh, there's, there is a huge mystery that is part, is part and parcel to the human condition. I mean, I think very, very often we're so caught up in our stories, and and the and the, you know, and the contingencies of life that we cease to reflect on the enormity of <laughs> of what it is that we're that we're, that we're facing there, there's a huge mystery here. Mm. And I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss to understand how anyone could, uh, uh, could, could actually sincerely take time and contemplate that and not be bowled over or baffled or marvel. Mm. At, at what it is, what this gift is that we have been given to be conscious. And I don't, and that, that seems to me it's so part of the very nature of the human condition that it doesn't seem an illusion at all. I mean, and, and you don't have to believe, you don't have to believe anything. This isn't about believing in, um, karma or God or, you know, anything other than taking a close look at your own experience and going, wow, this is pretty amazing. And, for, and from that, for me, what opens is a sense of this, a deep sense of gratitude that, that I'm, you know, I've been gifted this experience. Um, and I, and I think if, if people reflect on, contemplate, uh, spend time with that sense. They're they're changed fun. They're changed fundamentally by that. So is that is that an illusion? I'll ask you. What do you think? I I don't know. I don't know to be honest. Um, I, <laughs> it, it, it's it's one where I mean I was, a question I was just sort of formulating in my mind then was um, I'm, I'm I'm interested in um, whether. Um, these like so people that are you know reporting the significant decreases in, in in depressed mood and anxiety and and you know a deeper sense of meaning in in the life um is there any sort of follow up to see if if people change their lifestyles as a as a direct result of that or do you just know anecdotally that that maybe tends to be the case um because i guess one thing that might separate it from being uh, like a delusion is if, you know, if people take, take the, and, and this is going to sound very judgmental of me, I'm going to be careful here, but you know, if people, they take the psilocybin uh, and, and they, they feel this deeper sense of meaning and appreciation, but, um, you know, these are people, if they've been experienced depression and, you know, it's, I think it's fair enough to say that more often than not, you know, depression is something that develops from the outside in. It's a lot to do with people's circumstances. One of the um, common criticisms of antidepressants is that they tackle the symptoms and not the cause of, of whatever the depression is. 
And so I guess if, you know, maybe you take you, you, you have your psilocybin experience, but then you go back to your life with, um, you know, th- the world looks brighter and uh, you appreciate your existence more, but you, if you're still in a miserable job or you're still with a, a like a, a, a partner that's maybe not the best, maybe that would be a sense of delusion. But, you know, if, if actually you, you come away from that experience and it makes you realise that you need to change certain aspects about your life and you need to get rid of that partner that's that's not good for you and you need to get rid of the job that's that's not healthy for you. And I'm just wondering, um, I think that would maybe be a, a way of separating the two for me, but I'm just wondering if you know, even anecdotally, whether these experiences do tend to change people's, not just the thoughts, but the behaviours as well moving forward. Yeah, uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Right. So the hard, our hardest evidence there is the addiction protocols because that that's assessed yeah. early, right? And in our uh, pilot study in psilocybin and smoking addiction, which you may know has an abominable uh, rate of abstinence, uh, we had 80% abstinence at, uh, at six months, which is just unheard of. So, you know, that's, and that's a very hard and fast, uh, outcome measure. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, sorry, Roland, you know, I'll just jump in and say, I've got to say that the, the, the most, uh, f- for the little I understand about addiction, the most insane thing about that is that, you know, we think, of, we think of, and I, I'm, I'm assuming addiction is that it's a physical, it's a physical thing. I mean, I remember being addicted to, um, to, prescription drugs at one point and and to smoking as well and they they were really a really sort of difficult physical process to go through to 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 come away from those things and and so the idea that just this psychological this a profound psychological experience can be so successful in eliminating not just a, a psychological dependency but a physical dependency that's super impressive yeah well i mean and don't forget uh you know alcoholic anonymous was founded by bill wilson on the basis of uh of an experience of this sort it was not hallucinogen induced but it was during dts but he had a profound awakening experience and you know and that's embedded within the 12-step program because there's uh, references, I think, among six of the 12 steps back to higher power and some, you know, sense of something uh, beyond uh, oneself. So, so yeah, the, these would appear to be powerful interventions for uh, the addictions. There's work going on now with alcoholism that looks very favorable and with cocaine dependence, and that's also looking very favorable. Um, in terms of other kind of hard behavioral outcome measures, in several of our studies in the healthy volunteers, we do telephone ratings with uh, community observers. That's friends, spouses, family members, colleagues at work, asking them, has this person changed their behaviors? You know, and what we're looking for is have they, have they changed in ways that they say they're changing? In other right. words, are they, are, is this just self-talk? Are they delusional? Or are they really making changes? And those all show changes in the same direction. So, wow. uh, independent observers are saying, yep, this, this person has changed in those directions that they're saying they're changed. We've also done a study of psilocybin and beginning meditators looking at um, some gold standard measures of trait changes. Traits are, it's a, it's, it's measured by a questionnaire, but it's a harder, um, it's a higher hurdle to cross than simply reporting that you're changed. And these trait measures were changed in the same kinds of directions toward pro-social behavior, forgiveness, increased, uh, gratitude. Um, and I, you know, so our interesting behavioral targets, you know, will include the addictions. Uh, we're interested in eating disorders. Uh, there are other kinds of, uh, uh, behavioral outcome measures that are, you know, that are going to be, uh, defined very rigorously behaviorally. 
but I, I have no doubt that these kinds of experiences are going to be germane to that. I mean, if we, if we just rewind this to the beginning where we talked about, uh, you know, who had made observations of this sort before, you know, William James and his varieties of religious experience was talking about these experiences in terms of conversion experiences. And so he was putting it in a religious context, but think of the behavioral changes that occur in a, in a conversion experience where someone is a alcoholic and they, you know, they have a come to Jesus experience and they clean up their entire lives and, and mm. become model citizens and husbands. Uh, and, um, and they've changed really radically and they would attribute it to this kind of experience. And then they, they, they would have, um, explanatory explanations that go beyond that. And I'm, I, you know, I just, I, I, we don't, don't know how to interpret that. I mean, these experiences aren't incompatible with those, <laughs> those levels of explanations, but those don't fit easily within our, uh, scientific frame. So I'll leave those aside. I've got to say, you see, I know that, um, well, from experience, we, this conversation we're having now, so I mean, I, I did an episode just recently on a, a, a sort of a, a therapy that's being, um, a, a, a form of psychotherapy that's being studied at the moment called Method of Levels, and it's only really, so it's being exercised at the, the, the clinical trial level in, in universities where it's being studied, and it sort of experimented with at the community level. So it's 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 very in other words it's very hard to come by, and I had um, a, quite a quite a, a profound experience with just one one session of it, and I spoke about it on the podcast, and then a lot of people were getting in touch saying, "Oh my God, how do I how do I access this?" Now I can imagine people are going to listen to this and and the sort of results that we're talking about here, and especially you know people that are you know really sort of in the midst of a, a, a deep depression. The idea of a, a magic bullet that's just going to take all that away is is super tempting, and you know, I think you mentioned like you know, uh, like John Hopkins is sort of the center of the universe when it comes to this sort of research, or so it seems to me. And I think you mentioned that you've um, only really only studied was it about three hundred people, so this is super super rare, and members of the public are going to be like, where can I get this? And when they realise it's not freely accessible the obvious temptation is is to think well they mentioned magic mushrooms maybe i should give that a go and i just wondered if if you could address uh, well both both elements of that really like where when can people expect this to be more sort of easily accessible and what would you say to people that are thinking well if it's not accessible i'm just going to go and and give it a go myself yeah well so <clears throat> Let me let me start by just addressing the risks. So there, you know, there really are adverse um, events associated with uh, psilocybin and and the use of psychedelics. Fortunately, in our clinical experience, when we screen people and prepare them, and the, and we exclude volunteers who we think might get into trouble with them, we do not have enduring adverse events. But if you, we, we've run a, a large scale survey trial, uh, in which we ask people about their single worst experience, most difficult or challenging experience, having taken psilocybin mushrooms. And, uh, this is about 2000 people and about 60% said, uh, it was in the top most 10 most challenging experiences of their lifetimes. And 10% said it was the single most challenging experience of the lifetime. So these were not easy experiences. 11% mm. put themselves or others at risk for physical harm. About 3% were physically violent. 3% ended up in a hospital or an emergency department. 10% had adverse psychological symptoms that lasted over a year and 8% sought professional help. So these are people who had difficult experiences, felt um, uh, 
unbalanced by those experiences for over a year and sought out professional help for for treatment. So I, I think, and, and we had um, uh, three uh, reports of attempted uh, suicide and and three reports of a possible uh, uh, psychotic uh, enduring psychotic process. Wow! So so these so so these are you know potentially very very difficult experiences. So uh, in terms of of um, just find, finding some mushrooms and taking them. Uh, you, you'd miss the screening, you'd miss all the support. We provide a lot of, uh, of preparation. You don't know what the dose is. If, you know, even if mushrooms are carefully grown, they can, uh, vary in terms of their psilocybin concentration tenfold. So you, you don't, don't have any idea of what, what dose you're getting. And in, in some proportion of vulnerable people, they're gonna ha- they're gonna have uh, difficult uh, and enduring uh, 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 negative changes. So, so as you can imagine, I I think it's it would be irresponsible of me to recommend that anyone uh, do that. When can we expect these to be available clinically? Um, well, right now there are a couple of groups that are approaching both the Food and Drug Administration and the uh, the regulatory, the EU regulatory drug agency, uh, seeking approval of uh, trials to test psilocybin and depression. I'm guessing that those trials will take. Uh, three to four years to to run and you know another year for approval so I uh, you know maybe five years from now if uh, if psilocybin under these conditions is shown to be efficacious and if it, if it's not derailed by uh, some other kinds of findings it might it might be available clinically but there's no uh, I don't see any uh, near-term immediate path for approval. Yeah, I think you might find a bit of opposition from the whole <laughs> psychotherapy industry as well, because <laughs> you threaten to just bring all that down in one fell swoop. Um. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, very often these experiences open people up in a way that they actually become much more interested in their psychodynamic interior process than they ever were before you know so it's not uncommon for if we have just healthy volunteers to uh to have an experience of this sort and then want to learn more about meditation or other introspective conditions or want to um you know explore psychodynamic issues you know within you know their own histories that they've never really you know, contemplated. They're they're recognizing the complexity of of psychology and consciousness in a way that perhaps they had papered over before. Okay, so we're coming up on on ninety minutes now. Have you got five minutes for me to just run my quick fire questions, Pasha, that I like to close all my interviews out with? Sure. Okay. So. Um... Okay, so let's start with this one. The the, the uh, yeah. Do you have any? Have you got any book recommendations? Um, it, and it's either on this topic or just anything else that you feel would be of value to the listeners. Well, I think on this topic, "Man's Search for Meaning" by Viktor Frankl is uh, is a fast, fascinating look at at the nature of these kind of existential questions. Yes, brilliant book. Re- been recommended. That might you might have actually made that the most re- recommended book now. I think it's come. Oh. Yeah, it's come up a few times that one, and I I definitely agree. That's one um, one of them books I sort of have to have to revisit every now and again. Um, I'm, I'm also reading a book right now, Uval Noah Harari, Sapiens, which is absolutely fascinating. That's a brief history of humankind that I recommend. 
Okay. Well, as always, I'll in, include them in the show notes. Have you got any books of your own, Roland, that you'd like to give a plug to while you're at it? No, no, I don't. Oh, you've got to get around to that. That you're the you're the go to guy on this subject. You can make a fortune <laughs> on writing a book about this. Well, we have so much. We have so much interesting data to write up that I think that's where my time should be spent. Okay. Um, right. If you could have unlimited funding to research anything you liked, however niche or bizarre, what would it be and why? Oh, it's the nature of consciousness for all the reasons that we've just discussed. Uh, I think that's the, uh, the skeleton key into the human condition. Do you think that's, do you think that's an, an answerable question? Do you think the right sort of research or the right amount of funding could, could lead to an answer to that? I don't know. I, that's that hard problem of consciousness. Maybe not, mm. but there, you know, there are these convergent methodologies like psychedelics, like meditation, uh, you, you know, all, the, all our brain imaging methodologies, uh, you know, uh, um, there's going to be s different kinds of electrical brain stimulation. I mean, this won't be limited to, uh, to drugs, surely. Um, uh, uh, and and what whether or not that's answerable, I, I don't know. But that's you've given me unlimited funds. Yeah, to you're, go gonna, you're gonna have, have fun trying to find out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, if you could take the reins of power at the Department of Health, what policy would you implement to improve the mental well-being of the general public? Uh, yeah, I think I'm stumped there. Uh, it. I don't I mean, know if it, if it helps. I always say to people, just think like think like a dictator. Yeah. <laughs> well, it it has to do with this same same theme about appreciating the nature of consciousness and awareness. And so, I, I'd be reluctant to require meditation be taught because that's only one, you know, one way of of probing that. But you know, what I'm most interested in is. Uh, is people uh, uh, to join in this larger awakening process, uh, the project, uh, and if that's through meditation or other forms of uh, introspection and uh, and uh, in contemplation of what the miracle of what it is that we. <laughs> that we're doing here. And, and with that, I think comes this, this kind of resonant sense that we recognize that we're all in this together. I mean, there's something profoundly pro-social about that recognition when we're recognized we're all in the same pickle. <laughs> uh, so it would be something along those lines. Okay. What, if anything, keeps you up at night? Um, I, I, nothing. <laughs> I'm always envious of that answer. It doesn't come up very often, but when people say that, I'm like, oh, really? Like, <laughs> I do the worrying for you, Roland. Um, what's the best piece of life advice anyone has ever given you? Let's see. I can't, let's see. I can't think of something that someone explicitly has, has told me, uh, the best advice I give myself, I think, would be just to uh, to, to follow follow your intuition and your and your heart and your uh, and what you feel to be true. Is that There's weird? some kind of alignment that that is is possible in life, I, I believe, and it's and it's so it's seeking that alignment. Okay, what mistakes do you continue to make? despite knowing better <laughs> well, that's easy that's that's uh that's forgetting and it's and it's just this continuous forgetfulness as as i as other people do you know, fall into the story and the projections and the uh you know the the, the grasping uh uh that I know in my heart isn't necessary to fall into. 
it's just so, yeah, it's just, it's, it's forgetting that there's a much bigger picture mm. and just staying open to that. Okay, final two, the big ones. Outside of family and academia, what investment of time or money has brought you the most joy or fulfillment? Uh, meditation. Have you got a, um, just quickly, Roland, have you got a, a preferred um, method of, uh, of meditation that you'd recommend to people? Uh, no, my practice has changed over, over time. And, uh, and so I'm not locked into any uh, tradition or even any, you know, specific set of understandings. Okay. Right. Okay. Usually, this last question usually is, what do you think is the key to happiness? But I'm going to rephrase this, and, and I'm going to rephrase it based on on, on um, one of the lines in your studies. Um, and this was the, uh, again, we study in the cancer, the cancer patients. High-dose psilocybin produced large decreases in clinician and self-rated measures of depressed mood and anxiety, along with increases in quality of life, life meaning and optimism, and decreases in death anxiety. Now, um, I was watching a video on Jordan Peterson, the um, Canadian psychologist on YouTube, and he was talking about you in this study. And he said that one of the implications of, of this finding was that it seems that increasing the meaning in your life will result in a decrease in death anxiety. And so I'm going to rephrase that, that question from what do you think is the key to happiness to what do you think gives life meaning or just at a personal level, what, what gives meaning to your life? Hmm. Well, at the risk of just sounding like a broken record, I, I think it's the, it's this core mystery of what, uh, what am I, what am I doing here? How, how is it that this has come to be? And what are the implications? And that, and that, that gives my life meaning because it's an investigation and a, a invitation to explore and open and ultimately to connect with other people through that very question because it's the question that we all share together. Yeah. And I guess in, in that, in, in, in saying that it's, it's inquisitiveness, um, maybe, uh, w would you agree in saying that you, it's not necessarily about finding answers? It's just about the, it's about the questioning. It's about the being inquisitive. It's about the exploration itself rather than arriving at the destination, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the mystery is deep enough that I, <laughs> I'm not anticipating that I'm going to arrive at any answer. <laughs> okay, Roland Griffiths, thank you very much. Um, have you got any um, links? Any websites, anything you'd like to direct the listeners towards? Uh, let's see. No, no, I don't, Danny. Oh, okay. Well, I'll do that on your behalf, um, and okay. I'll I'll find I'll, I'll I'll dig up some links and and stuff. Yeah, and, well, and... I have some link. Yeah, I have some links on my email that uh, to some of our work. Okay. Well, I'll yeah, I'll include all those. And, yeah, and you could uh, you could uh, link to the TED Med talk. That's that's probably a good synopsis. There you go. Perfect little plug. Just squeezed it in at the end. <laughs> Roland Griffith, thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. It's been a pleasure. Okay, folks, if you enjoyed this episode or you're enjoying this podcast in general and you'd like to help support it, there are a number of ways you can do so. You could make a, a one-off donation for as little as a pound or if you'd like a little something in return for your investment, just £2 a month will get you access to exclusive content, including a monthly AMA or Ask Me Anything episode. Just go to myownworstenemy.org forward slash support. If you can't afford to make a donation, there are a couple of other ways you could help us out that won't cost you much more than a couple of minutes of your time. Firstly, you could leave us a positive review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, as it's called nowadays. Just search for My Own Worst Enemy Podcast, open the Reviews tab, and then click Write a Review. Um, I think that's what it says you have to do on Google anyway. I don't know. I don't use iTunes. But yeah, that's a, a good way of encouraging people to give us a listen. You could leave us a positive review on our Facebook page. That's always very much appreciated. Just go to facebook.com forward slash myownworstenemyorg. 
you don't have to actually write a review either. If you can't be asked, just click on five stars and I've done with it. Or four, uh, four stars is fine. Any less than four, I'd rather you didn't bother, to be honest, but you know, it's up to you, do what you want. If you'd rather not be so public about your endorsements, you'd rather just sort of blow smoke up my ass in a more private setting, that's fine as well. Just drop me an email, which is uh, danny at myownworstenemy.org. Or if you're really old fashioned, you, you don't do iTunes, you don't do Facebook, you don't do email, just tell somebody, you know, good old fashioned word of mouth, that always works as well. Uh, so yeah, that's enough validation seeking for one day, me thinks. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you again next time.